Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thanks so much for coming. My name is Deborah Carnegie, and I'm pleased to welcome Lawrence Steinberg to the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Lawrence will be discussing his book, Age of Opportunity. For anyone who's a parent, it will come as no surprise to hear that teens are the new toddlers. It turns out they are when it comes to development of the brain, as teens pass through crucial stages during adolescence that play a major factor in their future happiness and success. Lawrence is one of the world's experts on adolescence. He is a distinguished professor of psychology at Temple University and has authored numerous articles and books, including The Ten Basics Principles of Good Parenting, Beyond the Classroom, and Adolescence, which is the leading college textbook on the subject. He's an expert consultant and guest on TV, radio, and in print. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Um, what I'd like to do this afternoon is to change the way that you think about adolescence. And along the way, change the way you think about how we raise kids and educate them and treat them as a society. I wrote Age of Opportunity because I think that this change is long overdue. I've been doing research on adolescent development for close to 40 years now. And I've studied thousands of kids from all walks of life and different parts of the world. We're currently doing a study of 5,000 people between the ages of 10 and 30 in 12 different countries that range from those that are very wealthy, like Sweden, to those that are very poor, like Kenya and Jordan. I have a pretty good sense of what the science of adolescence says, and I'm always struck by the disconnect between what we know from the science of adolescence and the popular portrayal of the period. If you go to a bookstore and you look in the adolescence section of that bookstore, what you're going to find are a lot of survival guides. Um, and that's pretty much the way we think about adolescence. We think of it as something to be survived or endured. I did an internet search the other day using the words survive and adolescence, and I got back 2.3 million hits. Um, and then out of curiosity, I substituted the word enjoy for the word survive and did a search on enjoy in adolescence. And I got back more than 5 million hits. So I thought, maybe I'm wrong about this, until I started reading the actual results. So out of the 5 million, the first five were all for the same book. It's a book called Surviving Your Child's Adolescence. <laughs> the, the reason enjoy was in there was that the subtitle of the book is how to understand and even enjoy the rocky road to independence. I went on Amazon and found no fewer than 12 books on adolescence that have the word survive or survival in the title. There's actually, this is really true, there's even a book called How to Survive Your Dog's Adolescence. Um, and then I went and I looked to see if I could find books on babies that had survive or survival in the title and couldn't find a single one, um, which probably comes as a surprise to anyone in here who's recently had an infant because I remember the first months of our son's life, and I wondered often if I was going to survive the sleeplessness and the difficulties that come from having a newborn. The, the survivor's mentality hasn't really worked very well, at least in the United States. Our high school students typically trail the rest of the developed world in tests of achievement, and yet we lead the world in rates of adolescent obesity, binge drinking, STDs, unintended pregnancies, and violence and crime. So we're clearly doing something wrong. So what I want to talk about this afternoon is how we can do a better job of raising our kids. And this is obviously important if you're the parent of a teenager, um, or if you're a teacher, or if you're somebody who works directly with young people. But it's really important to all of us, because we all have a stake in making sure that the next generation is happy and healthy and competent. And that's really what I want to talk about, because I think we need a new way of thinking about adolescence, a new, a new vision of this period. And what I hope to persuade you of is that it is not simply or even a time to survive. It's a time that, that during which people can really thrive. And I think that the science of adolescence is showing us how this might be true. So I want to start by asking you to think for a moment about your own adolescence. 
Now, I know, personally speaking, I have incredibly rich and vivid recollections of my adolescent years. Not only do I remember the important people and places and events, but I remember them in a level of detail that's unlike that for my memories of other periods of life, for childhood or my 30s or 40s or 50s. It's almost as if my brain has stored these memories in 3D, high-def format in some way. And that's very perplexing to me because my adolescence was quite ordinary. Nothing terrible happened to my family. We didn't win any lotteries. There was no death. There was no serious illness. There was no change in our standard of living. I mean, life was about as exciting as a ride on a people mover in an airport terminal. Um, and yet, I can still recall things that happened to me in 1967 when I was 15 years old better than I can recall things that happened to me last week. It turns out that this is not unusual. Most people, research shows, remember events from adolescence more than events from other periods of development. It's a well-documented phenomenon, so well-documented, in fact, that psychologists, as we are wont to do, um, have given it a name. And it's called the reminiscence bump. Now, it had been thought for a long time that the reminiscence bump was due to the nature of things that happened during adolescence. Because a lot of momentous things happen during this time. Your first love, your first job, your first beer, maybe the first time you lived away from home. But what research shows is that even mundane events from adolescence are recalled with more detail than mundane events from other times of life. And it's not just personal events. The books, the movies, the music, even news stories that we're exposed to during adolescence are recalled more than those that we're exposed to at other points in time. So if the reminiscence bump isn't due to the nature of events, what can it be due to? Well, we think it may be to the nature of the adolescent brain. The adolescent brain, as it turns out, is exquisitely sensitive to experience. And because of that, the adolescent brain is more affected by experience than the brain is at other points in development. There are only two stages of development where the brain is this malleable. This plastic is the word that neuroscientists use to describe a malleable brain. One is um, the first few years of life, what we commonly refer to as zero to three. The second is adolescence. So, the, the, the notion that the brain is very susceptible to environmental influence during the early years has been around for some time. But the idea that the adolescent brain is also going through a period of heightened sensitivity to experience is a relatively new revelation. And I think, even in the context of the many things we've learned about the adolescent brain in the last decade, that the fact that the adolescent brain is very plastic is one of the most exciting findings to emerge in adolescent brain science. Now, of course, the brain, as I'm sure most of you know, is susceptible to the influence of the environment at all ages. The brain always has some degree of plasticity to it. But the brain is plastic during adulthood in a very different way than it is during adolescence or childhood. During childhood and adolescence, the brain is being built. New brain circuits are developing. Unused ones are being eliminated the wiring of the brain is being laid down. Those kinds of large-scale transformations in the brain don't take place after adolescence. So even though the brain is plastic in adulthood, I mean, it has to be, because whenever we learn something, if we retain that learning, there has to have been some underlying neural change, or we couldn't have retained it. So even though we can learn things as adults, and even though the brain, therefore, must be a little bit plastic in adulthood, it's not plastic like it is during adolescence. So the changes that take place in brain circuits during adulthood are relatively minor modifications to existing brain circuits, rather than the wholesale development of new ones or elimination of unused ones. What this means is that adolescence is the last period in human development when the brain is that malleable. That makes it a really important period for us to think about in terms of the kinds of experiences we give young people during this adolescent period. Adolescence is also especially important now because it's so much longer than it's ever been. It's been stretched at both ends by the decline in the age of puberty 
And by the delay in the transition of young people from adolescence into the conventional roles of adulthood. So at the beginning of the 20th century, the average American girl began menstruating at the age of 14 and a half. Today it's about 12. And pediatricians all over the United States are reporting increasing numbers of very young girls, seven and eight year old girls, who are showing the early signs of pubertal development, like breast development. There's also been a drop in puberty, um, in the age of puberty for boys, too. And it's comparable to that for girls. So the average American boy goes through puberty about two years earlier today than he did in the 1970s. Now, at the same time that this is happening, adolescence is taking longer for people to complete. We see this in the prolongation of education, of financial dependence on parents, delay in the age of marriage, delay in the age of parenthood. So just to put some numbers on it, 25-year-olds today are twice as likely to still be in school than their parents were at that age. They're only half as likely to be married, and they're 50% more likely to be taking some kind of financial assistance from their parents. So as a result of these two trends, the declining age of puberty and the increasing age of the transition to adulthood, adolescence has turned into a 15-year stage of life. <laughs> That's three times as long as it was in the 19th century and twice as long as it was as recently as the 1950s. So maybe when adolescence was a short period of time, it was possible to approach it as something to survive, to just kind of get through, hold your breath, and then you know, you'll come out the other side of the tunnel. Um, but it's a 15-year period, I think that that probably is not the right way to approach it. We need a different way. So when the brain is plastic, as it is during adolescence, it's not plastic in all parts of the brain um, at the same time. Different regions of the brain are malleable at different ages. During adolescence, a part of the brain that's especially susceptible to the environment is the prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain right behind your forehead. It's the, it's the CEO of the brain. It's responsible for all of our advanced thinking abilities, like decision making and planning. It's also responsible for self-regulation or self-control, our ability to control our, our thoughts and our feelings and our actions. Um, self-control is arguably the single most important trait for a person to have um, in order to live a happy and, and successful life. There are literally hundreds of studies showing that kids with strong self-control do better in school, they have better relationships, they're happier, they're less prone to emotional problems, they're less likely to get into trouble. So if you're a parent, even of a younger child, perhaps the most important characteristic you can instill in your child is strong self-regulation, strong self-control. It turns out that it's actually a better predictor of success in school than either intelligence or talent is. Now, on the other hand, poor self-control is a huge liability, a lifelong liability. We can see this in many, ways, in many ways, but one way we can see it is by looking at the factors that predict which kids are going to end up living in poverty. So economists and sociologists have identified four rules that if you follow, pretty much guarantee that you will have at least a minimally decent life. Graduate from high school, don't have a child until you're married, don't break the law, and don't be idle. If you're out of school and unemployed, take any job that somebody offers you. And if you have a job, and even, if, even if you don't like it, don't quit it unless you have something else lined up. And if you play by these rules, you will probably never end up in poverty. And that's not, by the way, a moral judgment. That's a statistical fact. Now, I know that there are lots of conditions and circumstances in people's lives that lead them to break these rules, some of which are not in their complete control. But poor self-control is often a part of it. Poor self-control is why people drop out of school. It's why they commit crimes. It's why they get pregnant before they want to get pregnant. It's why they impulsively walk off jobs without having something else lined up. As I explain in the book, there, there are huge socioeconomic differences in self-control that are present um, from as early as we can measure it. And we now understand some of the neural underpinnings of these class differences. If we could do something 
to help improve the self-regulatory skills of kids from disadvantaged families, we could probably do something to help close the income gap in this country. We need to think about how we might do that. Um, some of you may be wondering why the age of puberty has, ha has dropped so much. It's really due to three main factors. One is obesity. Obese kids go through puberty earlier than, uh, than, than uh, average weight or thin young people. And as you know, there's an epidemic of childhood obesity. Um, a second is the exposure of our children to endocrine disrupting chemicals. They're ubiquitous in modern society. They're in what we eat. They're in cosmetics. They're in plastics. They're in pesticides. And a lot of them have been shown to accelerate the onset of puberty. The third is one that I think will interest a lot of people in this room. And that's there's some evidence now that exposure to artificial light, especially light that emanates from computer screens and tablets and smartphones, may also hasten the onset of puberty. Um, it's not that wacky an idea. Um, first of all, we know that kids who grew up near the equator go through puberty earlier than kids who grew up near the poles because they have more accumulated exposure to light in their childhood. And if you talk to poultry farmers, how many of you have talked to a poultry farmer recently? <laughs> Probably not too many of you. Um, <laughs> if, you um, if you want your birds to mature faster, you leave the lights on longer. So there are some well understood biological mechanisms by which light may accelerate the onset of puberty. Um, now, having good self-control during adolescence is also important because it helps protect people against some of the most significant threats to their health and well-being. We've made a tremendous amount of progress in the prevention and treatment of disease and illness during adolescence. And in the developed world, um, the major threats to the health and well-being of young people are no longer disease and illness. They're behaviors. They're things that kids do to themselves and to others. So even though we've made these improvements in, in the treatment of disease and illness during adolescence, mortality rates double or even triple between childhood and adolescence because of kids' involvement in risky and reckless behavior. Almost all types of risky behavior reach their peak during adolescence. This is true for crime. This is true for experimentation with drugs. Uh, this is true for self-inflicted injury, like cutting. It's also true, and I find this so interesting, it's also true for accidental drownings. Now, there's no good reason to think that 15-year-olds would drown more often than 5-year-olds or 35-year-olds, since 15-year-olds are generally pretty strong. And so we can imagine that the reason that drownings peak during adolescence is not because of a lack of stamina, but because of a lack of judgment, because of bad decisions that kids make about when and where to swim. So if we could do something to diminish risk taking during adolescence, we could really do something to improve the public health of young people. Adolescent brain science has revealed some interesting mechanisms for this increase in risky behavior during adolescence. Um, puberty has many important effects on the brain. Um, it doesn't just arouse our libido and change the way that we look. Sex hormones actually affect the way the brain develops. One of the effects of puberty, which I'll discuss later, is to make the brain more plastic. That's one of the reasons why there is an increase in brain plasticity as we enter into adolescence, because of the, 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 the chemical effects of sex hormones on brain development. But another effect of puberty on the brain is that it intensifies our experience of pleasure. It does this by increasing activity in the brain involving a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Dopamine serves many functions in the brain, but one of its most important is for the experience of reward or pleasure. So what studies show is that when we anticipate um, something pleasant happening or when something pleasurable actually happens to us, food, sex, money, praise, doesn't matter, um, we get a little dopamine squirt. And that is what makes us feel good. And because there's more dopamine activity in the brain's reward centers during adolescence, um, good things feel even better. Um, in fact, and this is probably the bad news in, in today's talk, is that nothing will ever feel as good to you for the rest of your life as it did <laughs> when you were a teenager. Now, because 
things feel so good during adolescence, kids are often motivated to seek out experiences that they anticipate are going to be rewarding or pleasurable or exciting, even if those experiences seem risky or dangerous. And this is something that psychologists refer to as sensation seeking. The problem is that this arousal of the brain's reward centers occurs very early in adolescence, around the time of puberty. And at that time, the prefrontal cortex, which remember is the sort of the seat of self-control in the brain, the prefrontal cortex is still immature. It's still developing. There's a lot of development of what we call sort of the cognitive control system over the course of adolescence. And so the juxtaposition of this easily aroused reward system and this immature control system has been likened to starting the engines without a good braking system in place. And that turns out to be one of the reasons that kids engage in so much risky and reckless behavior. Um, but be, but because, uh, because the part of the brain that's malleable and plastic is this region that governs self-control, we can do something to help build and strengthen kids' self-regulation abilities. And in the book, I go through um, a number of things of what parents can do at home and what schools ought to be doing to help strengthen kids' self-control, which will help them do better in school as well as protect them from some of these risky and reckless behaviors that threaten their well-being. Now, when the brain goes through periods of plasticity, it's not simply open to the, to the benefits of positive experience. It's also vulnerable to the effects of harmful or toxic experiences. And so adolescence also, as it turns out, is a very vulnerable point in development. We see this in a number of ways. Adolescence is the most common stage of life for a mental health problem to emerge. If you look across all serious mental illnesses, the average age of onset is 14, right there in adolescence. And, and actually, if you can get to age 25 without developing a serious mental health problem, the odds are that you will never develop one. Very few have their first appearance after age 25. And very few actually appear before age 10. The uh, exceptions are autism spectrum disorders, um, and ADHD. ADHD is kind of funny to talk about in that sense because the diagnostic criteria include the fact that it has to emerge early during childhood. So if you never have ADHD until you're an adolescent, you don't get classified as technically having ADHD. Um, so adolescence is a time of great vulnerability to mental health problems. It's also a time of vulnerability to the harmful effects of different kinds of drugs. Um, so if you're using alcohol, tobacco, or illicit drugs before the age of 15, your chances of developing a substance abuse problem or even an addiction are seven to 10 times greater than if you delay that exposure to age 21. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, because we have a lot of scientists in the room, well, that's because of the nature of people that start using drugs that young. But that's not the explanation, because animal studies show that when we randomly assign animals, all mammals go through puberty so we can use them to model adolescence. When we randomly assign animals to be exposed to these substances near the time of puberty or randomly assign them to be exposed after they're full grown adults, the ones who are exposed early are much more likely to become addicted to the substances. So it has to do with the plasticity of the brain in regions that recreational drugs affect during adolescence. So exposure to those drugs when you're still young affects the way that these brain systems ultimately end up. Um, adolescence is also a time when we're vulnerable to the impact of stress. A really interesting paper was published earlier this year by a group of people at Berkeley. They looked at the relationship between growing up in wartime and life expectancy. What they found was that growing up during wartime takes years off your life. But it takes more years off your life if you're a teenager during the war than if you're a child or an adult. And that's because the adolescent brain is more stress reactive. It's more stress responsive than the brain is at other points in time. We know, uh, we understand a lot about the biology of this. It has to do with uh, um, the relationship between the, the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or the stress um, axis. And they affect each other's development. Um, but I don't want to linger on this notion that adolescence is a time of vulnerability. I want to talk about the other side of it, the fact that adolescence 
is a time of opportunity. It's a time when we can help the brain develop in positive directions, help people develop in positive directions. But we're squandering this opportunity, in part because of the survivor's mentality. Um, and there isn't a better example of how we're squandering it than American high schools. Now, I mentioned earlier that in these international achievement comparisons, American high school students are almost always at the bottom of the list. What's really interesting about this is that American elementary school students are almost always at the top of the list internationally. And American middle school students are kind of mid-list. So when we read reports about how poorly American students achieve compared to the, their counterparts in other parts of the world, it really is about high school students where there's the problem. And actually, if you look at data just within the United States, you see a really similar pattern. So the federal government tracks the um, academic competence of American students annually. It's been doing this for about 40 years. And it tests nationally representative samples of fourth graders, eighth graders, and twelfth graders every year. And if you look at the trend lines over the past four decades, what you see is that there have been improvements in the achievement of fourth graders and improvements in the achievement of eighth graders. They're small. There's nothing to get too excited about. But at least the lines are moving in the right direction. The line for 12th graders is absolutely flat. There's been no improvement in any subject area, no improvement in the achievement of American 12th graders in 40 years. And that's despite all the time and money and energy that we spend in this country discussing school reform. Now, the fact that American high schools are so bad relative to high schools in other parts of the world and relative to our own elementary and middle schools is kind of perplexing. Because if you look at the variables that we typically discuss when we discuss school reform, things like funding or teacher training or teacher compensation, uh, American high schools are not disadvantaged in those respects at all. We pay high school teachers more than we pay teachers at other levels. The study last year rated teacher training programs around the United States, and teacher training programs for high school teachers got much higher grades than training programs for elementary or middle school teachers. We spend more money per capita educating high school students than we do elementary and middle school students. The population of people in high schools demographically should be performing better for a couple of reasons. First of all, there are more poor children, relatively speaking, in our elementary schools than there are in our high schools. And secondly, by the time 12th grade rolls around, the really bad students have all dropped out of high school. And so if anything, that sample should test better than the younger samples, but it doesn't. Levels of proficiency among high school students, relatively speaking, are lower than levels of proficiency among elementary and middle school students. So what's the reason for this? I think the reason is that our high schools aren't very demanding, and they're not very challenging. I say this because our students tell us this in, in large-scale surveys. So in these um, achievement comparisons that we read about so often, where they test kids from all over the developed world, they, they also administer questionnaires asking students their attitudes and opinions about different things. And the, 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 the topics of those questionnaires change a little bit from year to year. And so not that long ago, they asked kids to indicate how boring school was. Well, there we're kind of near the top of the list. We came in third in the world in kids' ratings of high school as boring. Um, if you talk to foreign students who spent a year studying in an American high school, they will tell you that American high schools are much easier than high schools in their home country. American students say the same thing if they've had an opportunity to study abroad. Uh, two weeks ago, I was speaking at a, at a European Adolescent Society meeting that was held in Turkey. And I met a professor from a Turkish university who spent a sabbatical year at UC Irvine. Now, Irvine has what are considered to be among the best public schools in the country. So when she was on sabbatical, she had her 10-year-old and her 13-year-old with her. They were going to go to school in Irvine for the year. Now, these Turkish kids didn't speak a word of English. Their second language was French, not English. So they come to Irvine, and they go into the California schools without knowing how to speak English. And within three months, they were complaining to their mother that school was too easy, that, they, that, that what they had already learned in their Turkish schools was far advanced compared to what they were learning um, in Irvine. 
One out of every six American high school students says that she's never taken a single difficult or challenging class. Ever. Even just one. E ever. 70% of American high school students say that they would learn more in school if their schools had higher standards. Levels of disengagement in American schools are kind of off the charts. Now, I know that people that get to be in your place probably didn't have that high school experience. And many of you probably, when you went to high school, went to demanding high schools, and you took a lot of AP classes, and so forth. But you're a very small minority in a very large wasteland. I mean, the percentage of college freshmen in the United States who need remedial education is higher than the percent that has ever taken a single AP class. Okay, so we can't judge what the rest of the education in the country is like based on your experiences. Um, high schools in America have become these places where kids meet up with their friends and hang out with their friends. They're, they're, they're context for socializing more than anything else. And it, 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 it almost feels like kids think that, oh, you know, those bothersome things like classes just kind of get in the way of what I'm really here for. Now, the fact that we're not pushing our kids very much in high school has more than academic implications. There's been a lot of discussion in the education world in the last couple of years in something that people are calling non-cognitive skills. Terrible phrase, but it was coined by a Nobel laureate, James Heckman, and who am I to say that this is a bad way to describe this. But by non-cognitive skills, he's referring to things like perseverance, determination, self-control, grit. And we know that those things are fostered by challenge, um, and they're fostered by demanding a little bit more from the brain than what the brain is capable of doing. And so by not challenging our kids in high school, we are not only failing to educate them in the, a conventional academic sense, we're failing to instill these traits that are so important for success in the world of work and in life. And we're squandering this opportunity because this is a time when that part of the brain is especially susceptible to influence. We see this problem, uh, you know, what I talk about in the book is kind of a grit deficiency, um, by looking at what's going on on college campuses. And President Obama, the last couple of years, has been talking a lot about the need to increase the number of high school kids who enroll in college. And this is because nowadays, in order to get a decent paying job, you need a college degree. Uh, in, in, in the past, actually not so recent past, um, if you had a couple of years of college or an associate's degree, you had an economic advantage in the labor market over people that just had a high school diploma. That advantage has disappeared. In order to reap the benefits of going to college, at least in terms of salary, you need to actually graduate from college and have a degree. If you look at our record as a country with respect to college enrollment, we're not so bad. We have one of the highest college enrollment rates in the developed world. Our problem isn't getting kids to go to college. Our problem is getting kids to finish college. We're tied for last in rates of college completion in the developed world. One third of all students that enter college in the United States never get a college degree. Why do kids drop out of college? Some of them drop out for financial reasons, and, and we do need to make college more affordable for more people. But what studies show is that a lot of them drop out for other reasons. They drop out because they can't handle it. They can't handle the academic demands, and they can't handle the psychological demands, which, which require that they function independently without you know, their teachers and their parents looking over their shoulder all the time, because you need things like determination and perseverance and grit to be able to do that. And this is costing us a fortune as a country in terms of college dropouts, the amount of money we have to spend on remedial education, the cost to the individuals who've dropped out. So this is a problem that, that, that financial aid is not going to solve. And if our policies do nothing other than put more kids in college without giving them the skills and the capacities that they need to actually finish college, all we're going to do is increase the number of people in this country who are not competitive in the labor force but are carrying student debt. So we've got to figure out 
not only how to get kids to enroll in college, but how to get them to graduate from college. Now, I, I, I mentioned a little while ago that one of the effects of puberty on the brain is to make it more plastic, to make it more malleable. Sex hormones actually increase the development of new synapses, um, and they actually um, increase the, the development of new neurons. So we might think of puberty as kind of opening up this window of brain plasticity. But as we move through adolescence toward adulthood, there's a neurochemical change in the brain, a neurochemical change which inclines the brain towards stability, that makes it harder for the brain to change. And the window of brain plasticity starts to close. Now remember, adolescence is the last time when the window will be fully open. So when people move into adulthood, their brains are no longer plastic in the way they were during adolescence. We've actually identified the brain proteins and enzymes that contribute to this neurochemical climate change um, in the brain. It's really interesting research going on now about um, trying to intervene in the production of those neurochemicals to help make an adult brain plastic the way that it was during adolescence, which could have tremendous implications for the treatment of brain injury which is harder to treat in an adult brain because the adult brain is harder to, to modify. So there are some really exciting new research that suggests that we might be able to keep this window of plasticity open a little bit longer. And I say that because plasticity is itself a malleable trait. You sort of get your head around that, but, but, but the plasticity of the brain is itself plastic. And what studies show is that exposure of the brain to novel and challenging experiences during times of malleability not only lead to the acquisition of new skills at that moment, but they actually prime the brain to be able to take advantage of future experiences. They extend the period of brain plasticity. Paper came out earlier this year showing that people with higher IQs have longer periods of brain plasticity that extend further into adolescence than people with lower IQs. Um, so that makes me think, well, if we made people's environments more challenging and exposed them to more novelty during this period of time, we could keep their brains plastic for a little bit longer. There obviously has to be a ceiling on how long the brain can remain plastic. Because at some point in time, it's not advantageous to have a completely plastic brain um, because the risks of having your brain harmed by the environment outweigh the benefits of acquiring new knowledge and information. And as I explained in the book, adolescence evolved as a time during which we are sponges for information because we're gathering this information at, at a time when we're preparing to leave the, the protective environment you know, of the adults and, and bigger animals that have been caring for us. So at some point, you know, you do want to shift your brain from equities into bonds. Um, and, and that's really why the brain won't remain plastic forever. Um, well, if you look at what happens to people when they leave adolescence and enter adulthood, most of them experience a marked drop in novelty and challenge. If you think about going into an entry-level job, you're probably doing the same thing over and over and over again after a while. If you think about getting married, you're probably doing the same thing over and over again <laughs> after a while. Um, there's a huge drop in marital satisfaction during the first year of marriage, and, and partly because of the decline in novelty. So I will leave it to those of you who are married to think about ways of making more novelty in your marriage. Um, but by and large, most people experience a decline in novelty and challenge when they make the transition from adolescence into adulthood. Um, and it's novelty and challenge that keeps the brain plastic. It's a really important thing for corporations like Microsoft to think about in terms of the job environments that they're creating for people, for their employees who are in their early and mid-20s. Because by keeping those job environments challenging, and continue to expose their employees to novelty, they're really making an important investment in the, the intellectual development of their future labor force. Now, as you probably know, there's a lot of hand-wringing about how long it's taking 
people to become adults in American society. Um, but if this notion about brain plasticity is correct, maybe it's not so good to rush people into these roles of adulthood along such an accelerated timetable. I mean, maybe settling down actually isn't all that good for your brain. Uh, millennials, people in their 20s now, take a beating in the popular press. And they're described very often as self-absorbed slackers who are kind of taking their time getting to adulthood because their parents can afford to support them. And these portrayals are, are based on anecdotes. My colleague Liz Shulman and I decided to see if this was true by looking at some actual data on it. We looked at a large national data set called Monitoring the Future. Some of you may know it as a study of high school students, but it actually tracks its samples that it picks up from high school. It tracks them through their 20s, and it's been doing this since the late 1970s. So we were able to look at the psychological functioning of people in their 20s today and compare that to people in their 20s in previous generations. Almost no differences. No differences in self-esteem, no differences in narcissism, no differences in how self-absorbed people are, no differences in how satisfied they were um, in life. If anything, 20-year-olds today are more admirable in lots of ways. They're more likely to express a strong concern for the welfare of the community. They're more likely to say it's important to be successful in the workplace. They're more likely to say that they're concerned that their own children have better lives than they do. We also use these data to ask whether entering these different roles of adulthood at an earlier age is better for you. We found that the age at which people leave school, enter the workplace, get married, and become parents is largely uncorrelated with their psychological well-being and their psychological functioning. If anything, it looks like delaying some of these transitions is better for you than doing them earlier. This is especially true for parenthood. The people who delay becoming parents are happier um, than people who have parents relatively earlier um, in their adult years. So not only is delaying adulthood maybe better for your brain, it may be better for your mental health as well, as long as you are keeping yourself in contexts that are novel and challenging. So if you're the parent of a 20-something, of a maybe you shouldn't worry quite so much if your young adult child is not following the same timetable that you followed at that age. And if you are a 20-something, you might gently tell your parents to get off your back a little bit. You know, my advice would be just that you cash the check before you have the conversation with them. <laughs> so I hope I've, I've changed the way that you think about adolescence. That was my goal for today. That was the goal in writing Age of Opportunity. We often portray adolescence only in negative terms. We talk about the vulnerability of the period, and I don't mean to, to diminish the importance of that, but I think we've ignored the fact that adolescence is also a time of opportunity. So I just want to leave you with five suggestions for things we can do that might help make this vision more of a reality. The first is that we need to get the word out about adolescence being a second period of heightened brain plasticity. I mean, preschoolers, they get all the attention, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, who could be against quality early childhood education? But we've got to remember that that's an investment. It's not an inoculation of some sort. We can't just have better preschools and then cross our fingers and hope for the best. I mean, we've got to invest in other periods of development, too. And one where it looks like we really need to invest is adolescence. So that's number one. Number two. As I explained in the book, there are lots of things that we know about how to raise kids who have better self-control um, and these other psychological capacities like grit. Um, and we, people like myself, can do a better job of educating parents of ways to parent in ways that help instill these qualities in your children. Third is we've, we've got to make our schools more demanding. I mean, our own students are telling us that school is boring and too easy. We also can start incorporating into the school day some activities that are known to help facilitate the development of these important psychological characteristics. There's some really interesting research on mindfulness training as a way to help improve brain function, particularly in self-regulation. So that can be done through meditation, it can be done through yoga, there are many different ways of achieving mindfulness. Um, how many of you have a regular physical exercise regimen that you try to follow? Yeah. I mean, you almost never meet an educated adult in America who doesn't. 
And yet, and we do that, you know, because physical exercise makes us feel better. And also because we know that it makes us think better, it makes us sharper. And we've taken physical education out of American schools. The only kids that get regular physical education in American high schools are the star athletes. The rest of the kids don't get it at all. We really need to put aerobic exercise back in the school day. And adding an hour of that to each school day would do more to improve the achievement of American students than adding another hour of academic instruction. So we need to make schools more demanding, and they need to do more um, in the way of activities that are known to facilitate brain development. Fourth, we need to realign our laws with what we know about adolescent development. Uh, you know, a country that tries 12-year-olds as adults because they should know better, um, but doesn't let 20-year-olds buy beer, um, is deeply confused about adolescence, I think. Um, and one that lets people drive when they're 16, which statistically speaking is one of the most dangerous things you can do, but doesn't let them watch R-rated movies until they're 17, um, is really clueless. Mm -hmm. So I think we can use the science of adolescent brain development to inform our policies and, and laws governing young people. And then finally, let's stop telling young people that adolescence is a race to see who gets to adulthood first. It's longer than ever, and it's a more important period than ever in human development. And instead of rushing people through it, what we ought to be doing is thinking about how we can create contexts in schools, in homes, in communities that continue to expose young people to novelty and challenge in ways that we know is going to facilitate brain development. So that's my spiel. Uh, I, I really hope that you will no longer think about adolescence as a problem and no longer think of it as something just to survive, but instead think of it as a time when people can really thrive and think of adolescence as just a tremendous opportunity. So I am happy to take questions on anything about adolescent development. Thank you all. Yes? Have you looked at all of, at how habits are formed during this period? Um, well, habits are formed during this period the way that they're formed during, during any period, which is through repetition, um, right? And because we know, neurologically speaking, that when you repeat the same behavior over and over again, it strengthens the synaptic connections of the brain circuits that subserve that behavior. So re repetition is going, to make, is going to make habits. But we also know that if you stop doing things, if the brain is still plastic, if you stop doing things, um, that those synapses are going to disappear. And so that's the way that neurologically that we break habits. Yes? Um, so I have a question about the plasticity issue. Because the things that I've read previously have said that one of the big things that's happening in adolescence is that all of those, there's like too many synapses that have been formed and yes. they're all getting pared down. So yes. there's this huge pairing back which kind of is a little bit in opposition to what you're saying about it being this kind of openness or growth. Uh, uh, actually, actually not. I mean, you're, the, the first part of what you said is correct. The second part is not. So what you're referring to is a process that we call synaptic pruning. Right? So for those of you who don't have any background in, in neuroscience, um, when, when, during the very early years of life, our brains overproduce synapses, many, many more um, than, than we will need. Synapses are the connections between neurons. Um, and the process of brain development, really, once you exit infancy, is not so much the development of synapses, but the elimination of unnecessary ones, this pruning process. And it's kind of like changing from a, a, a system of, you know, lots of unpaved roads to like a, a smaller number of superhighways. And it makes the brain more efficient. So when we talk about brain plasticity, we're talking both about the development of new synapses and the pruning of inefficient ones, the elimination of other ones. So plasticity doesn't necessarily mean more, right? It means better, and it means, or it means change. And change can take the form of new synapses, and change can take the form of the elimination of old synapses. Does that help? Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, since it appears that our high schools are becoming less challenging, has, has the same thing been happening to colleges? Have they been sort of lowering their standards and get graduation rates higher? 
Um, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that there has been an increase in the number of college students who need remedial education. Um, now, whether that's due to the declining quality of high schools and the way that it's preparing kids for college, or declining admission standards in which we're, you know, we're so intent on just enrolling more and more and more people into college that we're enrolling ones who aren't prepared for it, um, I, I don't know. Um, I'm not, I can, it's easy, it should be easy enough to find out whether the college graduation rate has changed. I, I, I actually don't know the answer to that. Yes? So, question about high schools. And it, do you think <coughs> some of it is because high schools try to be a one size fits all today? I can remember when I was in high school, I know it was Stone Age. Um, <laughs> but I had a German teacher who, who visited Germany and talked about the school system in Germany. Not every school was designed to send a kid to college. Yeah. That they would segregate. You had kids who had tremendous hand abilities and skills that would go more into manufacturing type environment. You had the athletes who were going to go on to the Olympics and they would go in. And, and the people who went to high school were truly the kids who their vision and their strength was in going to college. And I think our schools today are very much trying to be a one size fit all. And so you've got all these kids in the same place with different aspirations and different end goals. And so you dumb the system down. So you're not preparing the college kids to go to college. You're not giving vocational training to a kid who wants to be a wrench turner. And you're not, you know, it, have you seen that? It's you know what you're saying has elements of truth to it, but there. But let's tweak it a little bit. Um, f this is not a change. First of all, the American secondary education system has always had as its centerpiece what we call the comprehensive high school, which is a high school that serves everybody. So right from the get-go, when we formed high schools in this country, public high schools in this country, they were always designed to be these inclusive institutions as opposed to the European model or the model in some Asian countries where we test people when they're 12 or 13 years old and then separate them into either college preparatory schools or vocational schools. So that's the first. The second is that even though we have this system of comprehensive high schools that serve everybody, um, within them there's almost always tracking. Now, it's either explicit tracking or implicit tracking, but there are the courses that the kids who are going to go to college take, and then there are courses that, um, you know, that the other kids take. So we might think of those as multiple schools within the same school building. Um, I, I, I do think that we do not do a very good job in this country of educating the non-college bound students. Um, and I think that's kind of what you're driving at. So Germany is always held up as the model of a country that has a very well-developed apprenticeship system um, and, and a country that hasn't stigmatized um, going into skilled crafts and skilled labor as we have here. Um, I can remember years ago uh, talking to our plumber about this. So we had this plumber, a very successful plumbing business in suburban Philadelphia. And we recommended him to a friend of ours who needed a plumber. And a friend told me, he said, I, you know, I called Joe. Actually, it was Joe the plumber. Not that Joe the plumber, but his name was Joe. Um, and he said, I'm not taking new customers. I, I mean, right? So the next time I saw him, we'd been using him for 20 years. I said, what's this about not taking new customers? I said, why don't you just hire more plumbers to work for you? He said, I can't find them. He said, because you need to be able to do geometry and math to be a plumber. He said, but nowadays, any kid who can pass 10th grade math is being shunted away from going into skilled trades um, and instead is being told that you have to go to college. He said, so, and, and if you talk to people in the skilled trades, they will say they have a tremendous difficulty finding skilled labor. And it's because we've gotten on this bandwagon here of saying everybody needs to go to college. Now, partly that's because you know, nowadays you, you do in order to earn a decent living, but, and I don't know whether we can reverse this path that we've gone down. There have been attempts to replicate the German apprenticeship system in the United States and it hasn't worked. And partly it's because our, our companies aren't very cooperative in, you know, in, in, in doing that. And um, our, I think our unions have not been really cooperative in, in helping to support apprenticeship systems. But, um, uh, you know, I, so I think the fundamental problem is that we don't do a good job of educating people that aren't planning to go to college, um, and, and therefore almost everybody ends up on a college track, um, which then creates a diversity in the high school population, which makes it harder to teach to, you know, to students who have such different degrees of, of, of uh, intelligence and, and background.
may contribute to your extended adolescence. Because if you're a kid in high school and you want to be a diesel mechanic, you got to put your four years in high school and then right. spend time going off to vocational school to actually learn where you could have been doing that and could have graduated high school at 18 or 19 as a skilled mechanic. You can't do that today. Right. That's right. Yes. I have a couple questions online around self-control. How do you teach self-control to kids, and are there any resources you can share on how to improve self-control? Sure. So the, the question is, um, uh, how do you teach self-control to kids, and are there any resources that I can share? Um, so there really are, um, I guess, three different ways to instill self-control in kids. One is to, is to parent in a way that has been described as authoritative parenting. Um, this is parenting that combines being very firm but with being very warm. All right, so we know from uh, you know, decades and decades of research on this that if you're warm but you're not firm, excuse me, your kids are going to be more prone to end up in problem behavior and actually have some difficulties with impulse control. Um, if you're firm but not warm, it's kind of like tiger mothering, um, we know that that's not good for kids either. It actually elevates their risk for anxiety and, and depression. So it's combining warmth and firmness, and that's been shown to be predictive of self-regulation um, in, in children, both young children and adolescents. So that's number one. Um, number two is to encourage certain f kinds of activities at home that we know strengthen self-control. I mentioned some of them like mindfulness, like meditation is really good for the development of self-control. Aerobic exercise is really good for the development of self-control. Sleep is very good for the development of self-control. And as most of you probably know, we have a nation of sleep-deprived people and sleep-deprived teenagers. So an adolescent, a healthy adolescent, needs about nine hours of sleep a night. And I haven't met too many who get nine hours of sleep a night. So number two is these activities. Um, number three, um, would be deliberate attempts to cultivate self-control. So um, one aspect of self-control that's very important is the ability to delay gratification. Um, and so one way that you might do that as a parent is that when your child has a decision or a choice to make, to, to really actively encourage your child to think about the long-term as well as the short-term consequences of a choice. Like if you, okay, you really want this thing. If you buy this now, how is that going to affect your chances of getting X you know, in the future? And, and, and the more that you sort of encourage self-control, um, the, the more it will develop. It's like what I was saying before about, uh, about habits. And, and the, you know, the more often we behave in a certain way, the stronger those synaptic connections get. Um, so there you go. Yes? You mentioned one possible outcome of time in front of a screen with the or early coming up puberty. Right. Have you seen any other effects, positive or negative, just with the proliferation <coughs> of screens, uh, video games? And yeah, yeah. Um, I get asked this question a lot about what the effects of um, you know, electronic media are on kids' development. Uh, I'm a little contrarian there, because I, I am not negative about it at all. I mean, to me, it's like asking you know, whether television is good or bad for kids without distinguishing between Masterpiece Theater and Jersey Shore. Like, it sort of depends. So I think it's, it's, it's very imprudent to generalize about you know, spending time on the computer or on your smartphone or whatever without asking what you're doing. I mean, there are applications that are available um, on electronic devices that are deliberately there to help build self-control. All right, so there are these working memory training programs that you can download you know, onto your smartphone and practice with them. Um, oh, there are a lot of claims about these applications that have not been validated. But we do know, at the very least, that working memory training does improve your working memory. Whether it extends to other aspects of self-control is something that scientists are, are studying. So, um, so, so that's one thing. A, a, a second is that in terms of social media in particular, a lot of parents have been concerned about um, you know, whether kids' involvement in social media stunts their social development because they're all having just their relationships online and so on. And there's no evidence that it does. And there's a lot of evidence that the people that kids interact with through social media are the same people they see face to face when they go to school. So it's, kind of, it's more like the telephone than anything else. And in terms of video games, um, 
I, I actually am one of those persons, there's a minority of us who believe this, that video games have actually contributed to the decline in crime among juveniles um, because they've occupied them um, doing things uh, during hours when they might otherwise be out committing crimes. I mean, there's no, the, the, the evidence that watching violent video games causes people to commit violence is so thin and so questionable that it's just amazing that people continue to say that this is the case. And actually, the California State Supreme Court reviewed the evidence for this um, in a case that involved um, w whether violent video games should be banned um, for teenagers in California. Um, and Not the California Supreme Court, the US, California Supreme Court, then the US Supreme Court heard the case. Um, and they ruled that, um, you know, they, they, they found that there is no evidence that violence in video games makes kids more violent. Um, so, you know, again, to me, it's really a question of what kids are not doing if they're spending all their time doing this. So in moderation, I don't think it's a problem at all. But we know that kids need exercise, um, and we know that they need sleep, uh, and we know that they need exposure to media in other forms as well. So if they're not getting all of those things, then you know, constant exposure to screen time is a problem. But if they're getting adequate sleep and they're getting adequate exercise, and this is not, their whole life just, you know, doesn't just revolve around this, then I, I don't see it as a problem. Yeah. Oh, what, how about somebody who hasn't had a chance yet? Yeah. Uh, you talked about the window of plasticity closing, and some of what I've read um, points to, or, well, almost mid 20s before that starts happening. And you also talked about, um, certain things extending that. So I wondered if, if that's consistent with your research and also what are the opportunities in that later period to either extend it or take advantage of that plasticity? Okay, so um, what we know, what we know about brain plasticity comes almost exclusively from animal studies. A little bit of research on human brain plasticity, a lot of it is indirect in the sense that we can, identify, we, can, we can identify people whose brains still seem to be changing a lot. We assume that that means that they're more plastic. Um, the maturation of the brain, particularly connections between the prefrontal cortex and the rest of the brain, is ongoing into the 20s. Um, it starts to slow at around age 22 or 23. It doesn't stop, but, but I would say that from a scientific point of view, the rate of change slows to a point where probably the change is not all that significant in terms of its practical significance. There are still changes in the brain that take place after that. The brain continues myel myelinating um, in, you know, into the 30s. Um, but that actually works against plasticity because myelinated brain circuits are, are harder to change than ones that are not myelinated. Um, in, in terms of what we know about what can extend plasticity, I'm basing this on animal studies showing that when animals are exposed to novelty and challenge, it seems to induce chemical changes in the brain that, um, that encourage more synaptic change um, in the brain. We haven't, you know, this research on humans does not yet exist. And so it's, it's, it's hard to study in humans now because there isn't a marker of human brain plasticity where we can look at a brain um, and say, oh, well, because you have these proteins in it, your brain is more plastic. Um, or because this is what the an anatomy of your brain looks like, this means your brain is more plastic. We're not there yet. We might be there, you know, but we're nowhere near close now. Yes? Uh, I was wondering, you talked about um, the transition into adulthood taking longer. Yes. Um, and you mentioned some environmental factors that contribute to people going into puberty, puberty earlier. Yes. And I was wondering about this extension of adolescence. Do you think it's due to a kind of actual extension that's environmental of this brain plasticity, or that it's more society adapting to something that was already there? Yeah, so the question was um, that I, I talked about environmental factors that have led to the decline in the age of puberty, and what were my thoughts about environmental factors or other factors that have contributed to the extension of um, adolescence. I think probably the, the most likely explanation is economic. 
Um, so that as the labor force has required more schooling in order to be competitive, um, people have had to remain students for a longer period of time. Um, and I mean, you know what we call a four-year college degree? That takes six years on average. All right. So people are not going to finish their education, their formal education, at a minimum. And this is not including you know, post-college training. They're not going to finish their education until they're 24, 25 years old. And what that means is that almost everything else is going to be on a, you know, a different timetable. They're going to be economically dependent on their families for longer. Um, they are probably going to delay getting married, and that's going to lead them to delay getting, you know, becoming parents. Uh, so that's one. A second, I think, has to do with the changing roles for women in American society, right? I mean, a, a generation or generation and a half ago, um, women needed to get married in order to get out of their parents' homes and, and live an independent life. They don't need that anymore. And so women um, then, <clears throat> they don't need to be married in order to live a decent life. And more and more women are in higher education and in post-graduate you know, graduate education um, than ever before, um, which then leads them to delay getting married and delay becoming parents. So I think these are social changes and economic changes. You had your hand up. I did. I'm going to actually cut us off, though, because I know you have a hard stop at 3, and I want to give people time to sign books. Okay. All right. Thank you, Thank you all very much. Thanks. Thank you.